Well, I kept having to go because I was playing the organ, but I didn't, I didn't really like it, and I would skip Sunday school or I would skip priesthood, and um, then I started reading some things. I started. I, um, friend gave me there were a few, I, I'd say a handful of books that were pretty influential. Under the Banner of Heaven mm -hmm. by John Krakauer was really, it's really good. influential, and oh yeah, oh my gosh, you have to read it. It scared the crap out of me. Yeah. I was totally, totally 100% active when I read that book. And then? It just, I mean, it, it kind of was like, like you just said, the wizard behind the curtain kind of thing. I yeah. just, I wanted to know more. And I was able to find out more yeah. from the church. And I didn't have to go anywhere else, but I yeah. got to go to the source and find it. Right. So it, it, it tells the whole story of the Mount Meadow, Mount, the Mount, Mount, Mount Meadows, Meadows Mount. Massacre. Yeah. Um, Not just that though, the polygamy issue, the, I mean, they take a scary yeah. detour. It's a cool book because it tells like, he tells two stories sort of simultaneously. It's like one chapter is one and, and it's Mountain Meadows and then there's like a more modern story about this family that becomes polygamist, these five the brothers. The Lafferty brothers. Lafferty yeah. brothers, yeah. And so he kind of like, he kind of <laughs> like know. alternates between these stories and you kind of realize how in a way they, they really are about the same issue, which is... Yeah. You know, do you follow somebody who receives revelation just because they say they've received revelation? Um, does you know? Do you just blindly follow the prophet and do what they say? And does that does that trump morality? Does does revelation trump your own inner sense of morality? Right. Um, because it did in the Mountain Meadows massacre, and it did for the Lafferty brothers too, because they believed that they were inspired to kill this woman and her baby. Um, and I, I, the, the point I love that that book raised is that in their defense at their trial, the lawyers wanted to claim um, insanity or temporary insanity, and they refused. They said, just because God spoke to us does not make us insane. And that really made me think, you know, does, if God talks to you, does that make you crazy? And as a society, we say no. We say no, God talks to people. That's what God does. He communicates to you. He gives you a little personal revelation. We're totally fine with it until God tells you to do something that society is not okay with. Right. In which case that means that God's hands are bound by society's view of propriety, which makes him a not powerful God at all. Right? And, and then that, I'm, that also kind of, that book... What were the other books that you read? Well, that, that book sort of informed my memory of 9-11 and it made me think you know those terrorists really believed that they were doing the will of God they had great great faith in their religion and in their beliefs and they believed that God told them to do this and then they did a horrible horrible thing that we as a nation were unanimous in our hatred for what they what they did but they thought God told them to do that how does that make them any different from Nephi killing Laban or, or the mother of the single mother of six I was just reading about, who instead of buying food for her children, paid her tithing. Right. You know, it's because she believed that's what God told her to do. Um, and I also read um, uh, in Sacred Loneliness, which I think is what it's called, and it was sort of the about um, some of the, the first polygamists and the and the wives. Um, and that's where I kind of first encountered the notion that Joseph Smith was a polygamist and that he had taken other men's wives as his wife and that there was this sort of uh, notion that people would be better off in the, in, at Judgment Day if, if they were sealed to the prophet versus being sealed to other people. Um, I also read then... After that, I read Sam Harris's End of Faith and Letter to a Christian That's Nation. That's what I'm reading right now. Letter to a Christian Nation is so... Well, End of Faith is great, What's Letter of a Christian Nation? Letter, letter to, to a, a Christian, Christian Nation. Nation is... I mean, Sam Harris basically believes that um, there is... There's no reason for faith. The idea of leading your life according to the, the belief in something for which there is no evidence, for which there's no physical or scientific evidence i.e. the existence of God, the existence of uh, a supreme creator, ruler, you know, someone who answers your prayers and, and invests in religion. There's no reason to, 
to adopt this system of beliefs as fact and guide your life by, the, by this adoption, which is what people call faith. How big is this segment of society that has a genuine disdain for science? Because they view science as contrary to their faith. It threatens their faith. Um, well, really all that is is just saying people have a disdain for facts. Yeah. That, that, that shine, that threaten their, threaten their paradigm, beliefs. which is held, their right. paradigm, which is held together by faith. It's just really like, um, so he's just, he's advocating for a society that is based on facts and reason and evidence and the scientific method. Does that leave you now with your membership in the church? <laughs> um, well, I consider myself an atheist. I, I, I believe that, that, you know, and I believe in things for which there are evidence and I, I don't, I try not to base my life on, on um, mythology or you know, notions for which there's no evidence. So I, I don't consider myself a member of the church. Um, my membership records I know are in some ward down in Florida and I've been exchanging sort of snarky emails with the ward clerk in Florida which I have, who, who I have never met. Um, and he sort of had me believing that I needed to go through him in order to get my name removed from the records of the church. But I've had other friends, I think maybe it was you, that's telling me all you have to do is write a letter to the headquarters. church headquarters. So I, I plan on doing that. I, for a while I was a little afraid to do that. I was afraid of how that would hurt my parents. Um, and I think, you know, part of me held out for the notion that maybe I would have a Alma the Younger sort of experience and that God would appear to me in, in a vision and tell me that I was misguided and that... Uh, and he would show me some evidence that would actually make me convinced that it that it is true. Um, but that was that was a very small part of me that kind of was holding out for that. And um, I mean, most of me realized that was totally irrational and silly, <laughs> silly thing to hope for. That's how you were raised. <laughs> um, but that is how I was raised. Exactly. I mean, I read the story of Alma the Younger all the time, and I know my parents are praying and fasting for me and putting my name on the temple rolls, and so. And I know that they're good people, so I don't see why their prayers shouldn't be answered like Alma's prayers were answered. And um, yeah, but I mean that's that's not going to happen. Uh, and so I am, you know, fairly convinced that I was raised in believing in a myth in a mythology of sorts, which uh, I I sort of have like sometimes I have negative feelings about and and feel sort of anger for my Mormon upbringing. And then other times I, I find myself defending it and saying that, you know, mostly I learned really good principles and I think... Well, if it wasn't that, it would have pr most probably been some other one. Yeah, well... It would have left you in the same position. No, my parents were Methodist and um, then um, they had a little girl when I was three years old, but she only lived a week and I think the sort of scariness of losing a member of your family made them sort of ask a lot of life questions. I mean, they were really prime for primed for the missionaries. I, I told my parents in October this, of the, just this last year, so I'm 39 years old, I was 38 when I told them. Um, I had already told, I told them about four years ago that I no longer believed in the church, and that was, <coughs> that was a disaster. I mean, my, um, basically ever since then I feel like my parents just cry at the thought of me. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm their only child, and um, they had such high hopes for me to be like the, the conductor of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir uh, or a general authority or s something like that. Um, and now I've just completely dashed their hopes. They're not, probably not going to have any grandchildren. Um, and I feel like they put all of their eggs in that basket. All of them. They, they yeah. I know they I know they love me a lot, but the fact that I am rejecting Mormonism is just it's like I'm rejecting everything that they are. Um, and that I mean that that makes me very sad. It makes me really sad that that I make them so sad. You know, I wish they could be happy for me because my life is great. I feel I feel whole. 